Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, Illinois. I also serve St. Luke's Covington and at Trinity St. John Lutheran School in Nashville. Thank you for tuning in to our Bible class. We pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Blessed Lord, since you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help, our labor is useless, and without your light, our search is in vain. Invigorate our study of your holy word, that by due diligence and right discernment we may be established by your spirit in your holy faith and be equipped to share it with others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Last week we began our study of Matthew 13 with the parable of the sower. The opposition to Jesus' work has been mounting, and the parable discusses four different types of soil, as it were, where the seed of the word of God falls. And Jesus explains it in verses 18 to 23. He says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what has been sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Now in this new section today, Jesus continues to teach us about the kingdom of God. Let's hear the whole section first, verses 24 to 43. It contains three parables and then Jesus' explanation of the first of those three. Here it is. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. He put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden 
since the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Here are some parables that we in rural agricultural America can relate to. Jesus is putting illustrations before us that tell us of God's kingdom. He is saying, I want to explain to you how it works when God comes to rule and reign on earth. How does God deal with people? How does he bring them to be his own and keep them as his own? Let me tell you what it is like. Remember, Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. Confessors of the faith have answered the question, how does God's kingdom come? In this way, God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives us his Holy Spirit so that by his grace, we believe his holy word and lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. God's kingdom is Christ's rule and reign in the human heart. It does not have boundaries that can be drawn on a map, but is present wherever the King, the Lord Jesus, is present in the human heart. So let's take a look first at the parable of the weeds, as it's been called. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. The disciples were stumped in figuring out this parable that Jesus told the crowds. So they asked him later when they were alone with him in the house, what do the different elements of the parable represent? Well, Jesus gives quite a few details here. He says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. So at the center of the parable is Jesus himself. He is that sower scattering the good seed on the earth. But this parable has a little different twist than the parable of the sower that we heard last week. In that parable, the seed was the word of God. In this parable, Jesus said the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. That is people, people in his true church. That's why Jesus himself is identified as the sower. Only Jesus can make a Christian a son or daughter of the kingdom of God. Christ alone is the Son of Man who has come into the world to humble himself and to suffer and die and rise again for mankind. Christ alone has, by his redemption, made it possible for human beings to enter his kingdom. He says, the field, in the parable, is the world. Christ seeks to plant his kingdom wherever human beings dwell. He will send his disciples and us to all nations. After he rose from the dead, he told them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28. And just before he ascended visibly into heaven, he said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth.
Acts 1. Thanks be to God, the Christian church has been planted all over the world. The Creator who gave us every species of plant and growing thing has also given spiritual life in the heart of sinners. In holy baptism, people of all ages have been given the new birth of the Spirit, the washing of regeneration. In them, the same Spirit continues to work so that we might bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. It's not something we can produce in, our, in ourselves. It's the gift of God. Just as a person cannot decide to be born, but rather it's something that happens to you. Life is something given to you. So also Christians are alive in Christ because God the Spirit has used baptism and the Word to make them alive. However, even as Christ is at work planting Christians in the world, the devil is at work planting weeds. That is to say, there are among us also those who follow Satan and are doing his work. Wherever Christ has done his work to plant his kingdom, you can be sure that the devil has also visited there and done his thing. And the word for weeds is not just a general word for any plant that doesn't belong, but it's a specific kind of weed. Some have called it a darnel that looks like wheat when it first comes up, but later shows itself to be something very different. In fact, noxious and harmful. The seeds are even poisonous. So the devil's not content merely to build a chapel next to every church, but he also has infiltrated the churches. At any given time, the church faces enemies from within as well as from without. Look at Judas, one of the 12 whom Jesus chose. He heard Jesus teaching, saw Jesus' miracles. Jesus sent him out in his name. This one turned from the Lord and became a tool of Satan. Ever since, the church has been plagued with false believers, those who claim to have faith in Jesus but are actually hypocrites. In Acts 5, we read of Ananias and Sapphira, who deceived the church of God and were struck down dead by God for their lies against the Holy Spirit. It was a very extraordinary act of judgment that God carried out. One of the points of this parable is that in this life, we do not normally have the luxury of seeing God judge hypocrites and other wicked sinners. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul had to take to task the church at Corinth because they had a member who was living in open immorality of a sort that not even the pagans would approve, and they were bragging about it. Paul has to counsel them to remove the openly unrepentant sinner in order that he might see the error of his ways and repent. And everywhere the true gospel is proclaimed, there the devil is also spreading false teachings, deceptions, lies, distortions of the true message of the kingdom. These too can be poisonous and lead to the separation of people from Jesus. When Paul gathered together the elders or pastors, of the house churches in Ephesus, he warned them, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. That's in Acts 20. Jesus rightly calls the devil an enemy. He's against every good thing that God is doing in the world, not just in the church, but in our families, in our society, among the nations of the world. Remember, he's the one who is like the birds that snatched up the seed that fell along the path. Remember the destruction that the devil worked in the lives of those who were demon-possessed. Those demons drove the people to live in the tombs, to take off their, their clothing, to live like animals. Those demons drove them to throw their bodies in the fire or to drown them. Remember how he brought loss and pain and suffering into the life of Job, but only as much as God allowed. Job chapters 1 and 2. Is there any misery in this world in which the devil does not take the light? And his ultimate goal is to keep people from eternal fellowship with the true God. The master of the house in the parable, however, is a patient man. His men want to go immediately and pull out the weeds but the master is concerned for every single plant of the good wheat. In the weeding process, many wheat stalks could be mistaken for weeds and yanked up, or their roots could come up with the weeds and they'll be destroyed. 
Sometimes people ask, why doesn't God right now destroy all the works of the devil in the world and in the church? Well, that would effectively be the end of the world, wouldn't it? And God is still being patient. He wants all people to repent, to come to the knowledge of the truth. He's creating more humans as time goes on and bringing more and more of them into his kingdom through his recreative powers by the Spirit. The time for the great sorting out will be the end of the age. Jesus said, the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. For now we must endure all causes of sin and lawbreakers in the world. And even in the visible church on earth, the time of sifting will come. I'm reminded of a passage in the book of Malachi where God's people are taken to task because they're saying that the Lord will never hold the wicked accountable. This is in Malachi 3. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. And once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Yes, the Lord knows those who are his. One day when Jesus returns, the unrepentant will be thrown into the fiery furnace where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, while the righteous, those who are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, we will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. The Good Shepherd Psalm has something to say about that, that life in God's kingdom. Psalm 23 verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. On this Good Shepherd Sunday, let's hear the music students from Christ the Rock Lutheran High School in Centralia sing the Good Shepherd Psalm, Psalm 23. It's set to music in this hymn, The Lord's my shepherd I'll not want. The students are accompanied by Mrs. Denise Hennig.
Now let's look at Jesus' next parable, the parable of the mustard seed. It's only two verses long, verses 31 and 32 of Matthew 13. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. God has a way of taking what is insignificant, what seems to be like nothing, and making it into the most important thing. Take Jesus himself. He was laid in a feeding trough as an infant. He grew up in the obscure town of Nazareth, out in unimportant Galilee. He gathered no earthly wealth, commanded no armies, founded no corporation. He did not serve as a prime minister or head up any earthly government. Instead, he called a few fishermen and a few others, a dozen in all, and began to share with them the word of God. Finally, he died the death of a criminal. And from these humble beginnings, God has raised up an eternal kingdom in the name of the risen Christ. Like the mustard plant that provided shade for all the birds of the air, the kingdom of God provides a resting place, a secure home for people of every tribe and nation and tongue on this planet. Jesus is telling us not only that appearances can be deceiving, but appearances will be deceiving. It looks small and insignificant, but God is doing great things. I think of the work of our beloved teachers who bring God's word to little children. To the world, what they do is insignificant. And there are lots of other things these teachers could choose to do, but instead of getting out there and climbing the corporate ladder or building a business, they choose to spend their days teaching little ones the skills they'll need for this life, wiping up their runny noses, cleaning up their messes, but also teaching them the word of Jesus, modeling for them the Christian life, showing them how to pray. Such a teacher is a pattern for the little ones, a pattern of the love of Christ. Each faithful Christian teacher is a real-life person demonstrating how it is that sinners come under the rule and reign of the Savior and how they live as members of his kingdom. Her life's work may not look like much, but Jesus shows us here that its influence in the long term is huge and amazing. The seeds that such a teacher has planted have only begun to grow. The lives that have been affected and blessed by her work, who knows how God will use them as her former students continue to live out the faith that has been nurtured in her classroom. And God alone knows what the results will be when Jesus returns and we see with our eyes the blessings of his kingdom hidden from us now. Yes, the work of God among us through the seed of the word is amazing, like that mustard seed. And now one more parable, and this one is just one verse long, verse 33 of Matthew 13. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Some of us have fond memories of women whom we loved working with yeast, or maybe man, a man. Maybe it was your grandmother or your mother. My grandma used to make the most wonderful buns. They were so light and fluffy and with a little butter and honey. Oh, they were just divine. Some years ago, one of my cousins gave us the recipe and my wife made some more batches of those wonderful buns. It's a time-consuming project but the effort is worth the result. The preparation involved working that yeast into the dough and then covering it up and putting it in a warm place. Now, you could not see the dough rise, but if you came back in a few hours, you would find that the dough had risen. It had pushed up on the lid or raised up the dish towel. In Grandma's recipe, the dough was punched down and then allowed to rise again. The coming of God's kingdom into the hearts of people involves the quiet and humble sharing of the word of God. Perhaps as two people share a conversation or somebody reads a Christian book, it may be a small group in a humble home or meeting place somewhere, or even somebody tuning into a Bible class on the radio. God strengthens that kingdom as people gather together like sheep gathered around the voice of their shepherd as they partake of the body and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper for the forgiveness of their sins. The smallness and hiddenness of the kingdom now 
are foretastes of the fullness of the kingdom yet to come. Well, the meaning of both parables has been summarized this way. When God is at work redemptively in Jesus to establish and extend his reign among people, that whole process is like the process unfolding when a man sows a seed or a woman puts leaven in a lump. In neither case is the human observer responsible for the growth. Both the growing of a seed and the raising of the dough are mysterious processes that God the Creator built into creation. Not even the most advanced scientist in the best lab can replicate them. They can only manipulate the forces that God built into creation. God's kingdom, just like the mustard seed and the leaven, though it seems quiet and insignificant, will indeed grow and expand and in the end will accomplish God's purposes and win the victory over his enemies. And Matthew adds, verses 34 and 35, All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And that quotation is from Psalm 78, verse 2. Psalm 78, a psalm written by a man named Asaph to review the history of Israel and interpret it from a spiritual perspective. It was written so that the up-and-coming generations would not be stubborn and rebellious like those who went before them, but would have hearts that are steadfast toward God. The psalm ends by affirming David as God's chosen king, a kingship fulfilled in David's descendant Jesus, who is bringing in the kingdom of God by his preaching and miracles, by his life and death and resurrection. Yes, may we all, by the power of the Holy Spirit, take to heart the teachings of Jesus and be a part of his kingdom now and forever. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by those children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we continue our study of the Holy Bible. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to join us sinners at St. John's where the gifts of Christ's forgiveness and salvation are offered every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Here's a shout out to the men at the Centralia Correctional Center. God bless you. I plan to be there again this Thursday for Lutheran worship and study beginning about 8.15 a.m. We thank our sponsor. We thank our excellent partners at V1047. They really are the best. And thank you for listening.